Hello, everyone. Before formally opening today's uh, seminar and webinar, I want to inform you about some technical and practical issues. Um, the webinar is being recorded. Participants are not able to activate sound or picture. Activate live transcript CC for subtitles in English. Ask questions in the chat. Chat moderator Emily will take up the questions during and at the end of the webinar. For technical support, send a chat question. And now it's time to start. Welcome to this webinar. The pandemic and well-being of young people. I'm Kurt Hartqvist and I will act as moderator during the webinar. I work as guest professor of public health at the Department of Education and Special Education at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. I'm also a member of the WHO Technical Advisory Group on the Mental Health Impacts of COVID-19 in the WHO European region. We are five presenters here today. After each presentation, it will be room for one or two questions. Please use the chat. At the end of the webinar, additional time is set aside for questions. We will finish at 2.30 p.m. sharp. As the moderator, I will make sure that we will keep time. Today's seminar and webinar was initially planned as a parallel session at the Nordic Council of Ministers Conference Welfare Forum in December 2021 in Helsinki. But because of the pandemic, the event went digital and some activities had to be postponed. However, the topic for today's event is as timely and relevant as it was a few months ago. Now it's time to hand over to the first presenter, Merete Löberg who is a senior advisor at the Nordic Welfare Center. She will talk about Project COVID-19, consequences of the pandemic for children and young people. Merete, please. Thank you, Kurt, for giving me the floor. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I will try to share my presentation with you. First, I will tell you a little bit about the Nordic Welfare Center, where I work, and then I'll talk about our, our uh, new project that we are focusing on. And then I will share with you some one of our, our uh, now uh, newest initiatives under this project initiative. We at the welfare, uh, Nordic Welfare Center are a knowledge-based organization. And our main obligation is to contribute to increased knowledge and sharing of knowledge and cooperation in the Nordic region. We contribute to the development of knowledge and on welfare initiatives, mainly in the Nordic. We compile and disseminate knowledge uh, that are uh, in from comes from the different countries on the welfare issues and they're all in a broad range of issues. We focus on the well-being and the living conditions of our children and young. Uh, one of our focus areas uh, are the well-being and living conditions of children and young people. Our target audience 
includes, amongst other politicians, decisions makers, non-government organizations, and researchers. And in this project I will talk to you about, we also have focused on uh, having a, including and listening to children and young people and a lot of their organizations. Over the next four years, from 2021 to 2024, we will focus on children and young people's opportunities for particip participation, development, and influence during the COVID-19 pandemic. This will be a Nordic cooperation project that will lead on the behalf of the Nordic Council of Ministers for Health and Social Affairs, but also from on the behalf of the Nordic Committee of Children and Young People. Uh, the, Nordic Council, uh, the Nordic Committee for Children and Young People, they are the advisory and coordinating body of all issues relating to children and young people in our region. This project is also a part of the Nordic Council of Ministers Action Plan for the period of 21 to 24, where the goal is to make our region the world's most sustainable and integrated region. One of the strategic measures to ensure uh, equal opportunities for all is to uh, make sure that children and youth are being heard and involved in all matters concerning them. We will be exploring, exploring the consequences of the pandemic for all children and youth, but we will also be focusing on children and youth being in vulnerable life situations, and we will be looking into those who are, might become vulnerable during this pandemic. We will be investigating the right to participate and to be heard mainly in two areas of their life, in school and in their leisure, leisure time. We aim in this period to strengthen the belonging and influence for the children and young people on equal terms. We will learn and from our mistakes during the pandemic, and we will also look for solutions that can increase participation for all in the future. We will strive to improve our knowledge and to promote well-being. Are there lessons to be learned from how the different countries and regions throughout the Nordic have met this challenge? If so, we will disseminate that knowledge and provide inspiration so that we all can come out strengthened. When compiling knowledge, we explore and compare the welfare initiatives and how the children and youth are doing. We pay particular uh, attention to promising policies and solutions that we can share, and then we share them. Most importantly, we also listen in to children and youth. We find common grounds for cooperation, and we involve children and youth. And we also in, invite you to listen to what they have to say. We will now soon share with you one of our newest initiatives where we are interviewing young people throughout the Nordic region, including all the Nordic countries, but the Faroe Islands and Greenland also. We have given the microphone to, to youth and we have interviewed them on how they have been doing, if they had something they would like have to say, and how the consequences of the restrictions mainly have had an impact on their life. So we will invite you to follow us, us you to follow us uh, throughout this spring because we will let, be giving out some of the interviews uh, during May and June. And uh, today you will meet two of our young. So I think Emily, if you want to share. Hej, jag heter Mira och jag är precis färdig med mitt första år för att bli socionom. Under hela min första termin träffade jag ingen från min utbildning. Vi hade till exempel Inspark, men den var på datorn. Jag skulle vilja säga att jag är en person som är ganska extrovert och mår bra av att vara i sociala sammanhang med människor. Så det har varit ganska jobbigt ändå, skulle jag säga. 
Eftersom jag är med i studentrådet så tycker jag att vi ganska tidigt tog upp det här med att vi vill veta hur det ser ut om det är på plats eller om det inte är på plats. Och det tycker jag kanske inte att vi riktigt fått så bra respons på. Jag har hamnat liksom i en situation där jag hyr ut en bostad som jag egentligen trivs väldigt bra med i Stockholm. För att hyra ett pyttelitet rum i Norrköping som jag knappt är i och fått bo typ Ja, men hos mina föräldrar lite grann och mest har jag bott liksom hos min partner. Vi har ju till exempel studenthälsa. Jag tycker kanske att lärarna inför och under kurserna ibland borde nämnt det. Att så här, bara som ni vet, vi vill bara nämna igen att är det jobbigt så kan ni få kontakt med studenthälsan och då gör ni på det här sättet till exempel. Mycket under pandemin har man ju pratat om vad man inte får göra såklart. Men att man kanske också hade behövt lite mer med vad får man göra och hur gör man det och var vänder man sig då liksom. Ungdomar och unga vuxna är ju på något sätt också mycket framtiden och därför är det viktigt att lyssna på vad de behöver. Hej, jag heter Julia och jag började gymnasiet under coronapandemin. När jag började första rim så började det liksom successivt bli mer och mer distansundervisning tills det var typ full distansundervisning majoriteten av första året. Där i början gick det helt okej. Och det var nästan lite kul. Men den känns lika av väldigt, väldigt fort. Man fick som sagt för lite så väldigt mycket på spel och liksom onlineaktiviteter och sådana saker för att lära sig av nya människor. Det är nog en grej jag hade velat ha mer inflytande på att typ ha. Alltså typ så här, man går in i ett myt och man liksom, jag menar, får hänga lite typ, som man gör på rasten. Men jag tycker typ att vi hade kunnat ha längre raster mellan lektioner. Jag tror att skolan säkert hade kunnat sponsra lite mobildata till folk som man hade kunnat vara ute. Det hade nog varit en jättebra idé. Eftersom att ett stort problem var att man inte fick frisk luft och vara ute och röra på sig. Istället för att säga åt ungdomar att tala ut så måste man ge dem en plattform också för att göra det. Jag tror att den plattformen hade gett åtminstone liksom en möjlighet att känna sig lyssnad och hörd. Okej, okay. thank you very much Meriti and I take the opportunity to ask Saga to take control over my microphone and uh, my video. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Merite. I, I'm asking Emily, are there any questions in the chat that you will bring up? One, we have time for one or two questions. There are no questions at the moment, but I'm sure there will come in some questions and we can take them at the end of this webinar. Okay, that sounds great. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks again, Merte, and um, I welcome our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Arya Rimpele. She's a professor of public health at Tampere University in Finland at the Faculty of Social Sciences. And uh, she will talk about the effects of the pandemic on schooling, teaching and well-being and report from a national survey that took place in 2020 and 2022. Arja, welcome, please. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. This was a title about schooling, teaching and well-being of adolescents and in 2000, 2022. And uh, uh, why we get this data was that in March 2022, when schools were closed suddenly, society was closed. So some of us, the researchers, we thought that, okay, we need data. So we had a group of uh, researchers from education, Professor Marie Paulina Weidekainen from Tampere and Professor Vista Hotulainen uh, from University of Helsinki and me, which represented public health. So we combined our expertise and we had our people working with us, see the names below. So I'm going to present results from this study. Um, actually, we had a very short time for preparation to meet in the, the survey. Uh, the, but Ministry of Education and Culture was uh, interested in it, in it, and it promised financing uh, because they needed data too. 
and the scientific purposes, however, <laughs> were a bit secondary for them, but we could put a lot of things to them. So actually, we invited all primary and lower secondary schools in Finland, and it was done by Quatrix web surveys. And we did not only target the surveys to, to children, but also parents, teachers, school welfare personnel, and principals. And these were delivered by the school principals through their normal information channels. And the timing was uh, May 2020, November 2020, spring 21, spring 22. And actually, we just finished the last data collection a few minutes, a few weeks ago. So uh, uh, schools were closed altogether for two months in Finland. But they were reopened for two weeks uh, before the end of the spring. And that was the time when we were able to do the survey. But uh, altogether, until today, there has been regional, local, school-based or class-based quarantines, uh, shorter or longer. And uh, for instance, this spring, about the third reported uh, that they had been in quarantine for shorter or longer time. Um, what happened in schools then? They were transferred to distance teaching almost overnight in 2000. 2020, and actually they were not prepared for that. Very few of them had had any any um, uh, kind of previous experience of that. Uh, the ministry did not make any adjustment for learning goals. Parents' responsibility for children's learning increased uh, really a lot. Then about the schools had a variety of infrastructure and competencies for starting these distance learning practices. And also homes, they had varying digital facilities for distance learning. Uh, and for schools and municipalities, it took some time before they could organize proper laptops to every child. But this was not all, because also uh, access to school welfare services was limited. For instance, schools have nurses were transferred to other jobs, particularly vaccination. Then about that, of course, this shows that there must be inequalities in learning and well-being. This is not my topic today, but just about notice about that. So what kind of well-being measures did, did we have for children in the questionnaire? So it was stress symptoms, health complaints, those what have been used very much. Next, all the back pain, headache, difficulties in falling asleep or getting awake at night, tiredness, exhaustion, low mood or depression, and difficulties with concentration. And in addition to that, we had feeling lonely. Uh, here are examples of the stress symptoms. Low mood or uh, depression and tiredness or exhaustion. And this first one is during the lockdown, which was asked retrospectively in May. Uh, then about in November, survey spring 21 and spring 22. And these ones, the yellow one is the reporting daily symptoms, uh, weekly, monthly, and not at all or rarely. And here you see how many schools and children we had. It's here. So if we now look at what happens, we can see that there's quite a clear trend. So that uh, time passing, there's an increase in symptoms. And this is just the two of the, of the uh, stress symptoms here, two others. And we see that there is very much the same kind of trend. I don't present the other one because it's also the same. Then about feeling lonely. This first, during lockdown, this was also asked retrospectively. At, do they, did they have loneliness? And this was in May. Do they have loneliness at that time? And of course, this is quite natural that when the school started, they had much less loneliness. Loneliness has been somewhat, not much, but somewhat higher in the two later surveys, but not as much as it was in lockdown. Then about quarantine in schools, which was asked to them if they had any. Uh, I present 2021 results here. So, when they were asked about daily symptoms of COVID, if they had had a guaranteed short or longer, there was 16% reported symptoms, 12 if not, and weekly symptoms, uh, 44 and 42, and for feeling loneliness, very small difference, 9 and 8. 
Then about distance learning and well-being. Uh, we used uh, transactional distance theory, which means that a tighter structure of distance teaching and more regular dialogue between teachers and learners reduces the so-called transactional distance, even in a long physical distance. And structure measures what we used were following the schedule, so following the lessons, uh, perceived difficulty of a task, and for dialogue we used two, uh, two measures. Teacher was available during the classes or, or other scheduled times through video, chat, or in some other way, or if the teacher taught through video. Here are some results. I'm describing the results by odds ratio, which means that we mark the zero, the comparison group, with 1.0. And if that's higher, it means that some kind of effect is seen. Uh, for instance, here is the structure. Uh, if uh, the schedule was not followed, it was uh, 1.8, which is clearly higher than 1.0. Oh, and partly something between. Uh, if, if the task were diff more difficult compared to normal, again, more symptoms. And if the teacher was not available or only occasionally, 1.5 compared to 1, and then here are something between, which was also a bit, a bit more symptoms. We also measured problems with internet or equipment. If they did not have them at all, compared to daily, there's a, uh, nearly four times higher watch races seen here. And the more, the more problems, the more symptoms. And support for studies also, we could see it here. If there were less studies than normally, we see a higher watch races again. Then I come to the conclusion. So we cannot exclude a, a small worsening of adolescent mental well being due to the pandemic. But Worsening was seen already before the pandemic, for instance, in the Finnish school health promotion survey, uh, which showed already several years earlier an increase in, in stress symptoms. Then about the guarantees of school or class, it may have a small negative effect on adolescent stress symptoms and feeling loneliness. But at the moment, it is so small that we, we really cannot cannot be sure of that. Then about the distance learning. Uh, so uh, less structure, less dialogue in teaching, more problems with digital devices and internet, more difficult tasks and less support for studies. All these were related to increased stress symptoms and feeling loneliness. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Aria. And uh, I know that you already got some response in the chat. So I'm asking Emily, can you select a question that you, we can bring up directly? There's, there's, there's one question, but it's for every one of the panelists. So I think we should take it at the end of this webinar. OK, that's fine for me. Then we say thanks again to Arya and move to our next presenter, which who, uh, who is Ashley Müller, who is a senior researcher at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. And uh, Ashley will uh, talk about what are the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic on young people's mental health in the Nordic countries. And she's talking, being informed by a systematic scoping review. So Ashley, welcome, please. Thank you, Kurt. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Great to be here. Um, Kurt already introduced me. Um, I'll be talking about yeah, the same topic as, as I guess many of us, um, but my data sources specifically, a couple of types of systematic reviews that we write here at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. So there are three things I want to do today. One is to answer this question, what are the consequences of the pandemic on the mental health of Nordic youth, from what we know from from research. I also want to be very transparent about my own role in this research question as, as a systematic reviewer, as we call ourselves. 
And then hopefully I want this presentation to, to be a kind of practice for you in the audience to critically approach a policy question or a research question that's answered then with research. So I, start, I want to start with being critical of me. So just write in, the, write in the comments or write in the chat if you have any questions or if you think maybe, yeah, if you have some questions about methods or what I'm saying. Typically in medical research, uh, we begin with a slide about financial disclosures to eliminate any potential conflicts of interest. I don't have any financial disclosures, but I'm not, I'm not objective. I don't think science is objective. So I think it's worth mentioning a few parts of my background here. And I want you to keep in mind as you're, as you're listening to me. I'm a mental health researcher. I worked quite a lot with substance use research and substance use disorder research. And I worked with evidence synthesis for three years. And evidence synthesis is what we call writing systematic reviews or analyses, which are underpin kind of evidence-based policies. So in Norway, for example, when the Directorate of Health wants to implement a new health policy or a new social welfare policy, or even maybe roll out a new medicine, they should first make sure that this treatment is more effective than the current opportunity or a systematic review, often from my department, in which we try to identify every single research study that is reported on the effects of this new treatment or this new policy or this new medication sometimes, and then we combine that data. So in February 2020, um, I was mobilized as part of my institute emergency research response team. And in that, I estimate that I, I read the, the title in the abstract, so about the first page of the first 4,000 studies on COVID. So those first few months uh, were pretty awful. They're awful for everyone, but you know, I was safe in Norway. You know, my, my friends and my family were spread out throughout the world. But those, those first 4,000 studies were exclusively reporting on people dying. Uh, first, it was elderly Chinese people, then it was elderly Italian people, then it was Iranians. So I was relieved by lockdown. Personally, it made me feel safe <laughs> and connected. And I was, I was very privileged with my job. It was totally fine to work from home. So I was never one going to um, anti anti restriction protests. Um, I'll be talking about mental health and Nordic, but I'm not, not, not Nordic, not Norwegian. This is the picture of Boston where I'm from. Um, and neither do I have children. So I definitely don't have that, that lived experience of having to take care of children in the past four, few years or even having to support a youth and someone older. Um, also really interested in decolonial theory, which I won't go into today, but I'm putting it down because it definitely is a reason why I approach policy and research as critically as I do. So enough about me. Uh, the Norwegian government, particularly the, the, the Directorate of Family, Youth and Children, has been extremely concerned with the effect of the pandemic, but also the effect of restrictions on children and youth from the very beginning, of course, you know, lockdown, homeschooling, homeschooling. So in August of 2020, they ordered the first, what we call a scoping review of all studies about youth outcomes over the entire world. The next year, they ordered three additional lists of studies, so annotated bibliographies, we call them, specifically on Scandinavian youth. Then they ordered an update of this rapid scoping review, and they focused on consequences. So I want to, there are two things I want to highlight here. They're interested in consequences. They're interested in the effects of the pandemic, the effects of restrictions, so causal relationships. But they needed to know this information fast, really fast. So they were ordering, they, they were looking for scoping reviews. Um, and those are reviews that we were able to write much more quickly than full systematic reviews would often take eight months or nine months. Um, but scoping reviews don't, don't contain any kind of systematic analysis. So they actually can't answer a question about effect, but they can give you a really good overview of all the studies. So what I wanted to do in this presentation then is to actually answer this research question. What has been the consequences of the pandemic on Nordic youth? Um, okay, so throughout having written all of these reviews, um, I think the consensus in Norway was pretty clear. I think uh, most people, including the government, agreed that the pandemic negatively affected youth mental health and restrictions. So if we were in small groups today, I would ask you to talk to your neighbor and say whether or not you agreed, but instead just feel free to write in a comment or to think for a second, you know, about whether or not you agree with, with, with that this is what most people have been thinking over the past two years. So for this presentation, I went back to all of our reviews and I looked at all longitudinal studies that we had found, which had measured mental health at least twice. So we only found five from Nordic countries, actually. And this is estimate, is estimates up to date as of the end of last year. Uh, two from Norway, one from Sweden, one from Iceland. And what I did was I looked at all mental health outcomes. So any anything, depression, stress, anxiety that was measured on a scale 
So it didn't matter if it was on a one to eight scale or a zero to a hundred scale. And then I standardized them. So I kind of squished them onto the same scale so that we could then compare the numbers across studies. Four of the five studies compared um, mental health among one group before the pandemic with a different group during the pandemic. And the risk here, of course, is that any differences between these two groups could be due to something else. It could be due to, they could be due to getting older or because the second group's school shut down or had more infection or because these two groups are just different, right? So four of the five studies, we just have to be careful, might've been measuring not effect of the pandemic, but differences between groups of youth. So I have a picture of here of apples and oranges. It's not necessarily comparing apples and oranges, of course, but a group of youth before the pandemic and a group of youth during the pandemic might not be totally comparable if we're trying to say whatever this difference is, is due to the pandemic or due to restrictions. So pretty immediately, I thought that there was a mismatch between kind of the evidence, what we call it, and, and the results, so which are the results of this review and the consensus at the time. So before I show you summarized differences, um, if you want to write in the chat and make a prediction about what I saw, uh, feel free. Before I talk about this, just a really quick statistical lesson, because this is part of my job at work. When I say that I standardize results across studies, I put them on the same scale so that we could compare them. So when we do this, here you see the, the mental health outcomes on the left-hand side and the numbers, number of studies that reported that outcome. So when we do this, any numbers that are above about 0.8, either greater than 0.8 or smaller than negative 0.8, we say they show a large difference. So we assume that it's noticeable and meaningful to the person. Um, numbers in that second little bar between 0.5 and 0.8, we call medium differences. So also noticeable and meaningful. Numbers less than 0.5, but more than 0.2, we call small. So statistically significant, but probably not important to the person. And anything else close to zero in that gray bar, in those gray bars, we, we assume isn't really even noticeable. So numbers on the left-hand side suggest that the group before the pandemic had better scores, more life satisfaction, more higher happiness, better future expectations. And the numbers on the right side suggest that the group during the pandemic had better scores. Okay. So here are the results. Life satisfaction. Um, came from this Norwegian study that compared 12,000 teenagers before COVID with 4,000 after. And here we see between a small, between a small and a medium difference. So the group, the group um, before the pandemic to a small or medium extent had higher life satisfaction. Happiness was measured by a Swedish study, small difference maybe, benefiting in the direction of the group before the, the pandemic. Um, future expectations, or I think hope in the future, when the studies called it, was measured by both this Norwegian and the Swedish study. And we see mental well-being, depressive symptoms, loneliness, stress, not really any difference. Uh, and I hopped over psychological distress because that was reported by a different Norwegian study. And this was, this was actually longitudinal, the same 4,000 teen teenagers self-reported psychological distress before and during the pandemic. But with no, no yeah, statistically significant kind of change over time. So my conclusion from this is that overall, we don't see any meaningful differences before or during the pandemic for most outcomes measured in kind of the general population of Nordic children and youth, with the exception being life satisfaction with Norwegian data, in which teenagers before COVID did seem to report, again, a small or medium degree of higher life satisfaction than those during COVID. So I think I would sum up by saying we don't have causal data yet, for Nordic youth, other countries might, and there definitely might have been things published very recently that I haven't seen. Um, in the data we have, we mainly don't see any significant differences. The one study that followed teenagers over time also didn't report any meaningful differences in psychological distress. It does not mean that the pandemic has not caused mental health problems, but that the published studies included in our review did not report this. So in my experience, the, con the consensus is still that the pandemic has had these consequences, so either studies haven't caught up yet or the situation is more, more nuanced, right? This presentation focused on um, uh, yeah, general populations and not according to pre-existing mental health status or socioeconomic status or, or immigrant or refugee status, LGBTQ identification. There are certainly a lot of factors we already know impact mental health, but this has to be explored in a different presentation. So to end with, I'd like you to think for a second of any question you might have regarding COVID or restrictions infection prevention and control policies, 
mental health, which could be relevant to policy and then answerable by research. Um, maybe, you know, regarding the best way to provide online prevention services or, or finding out the strongest prevent protective factors. And I want you to think about who you are, um, like the things maybe that I've reported about myself, think about your background, your experiences, your exposure to kids and youth, and how how all these things have some influence on the question you're asking, potentially, and on the answers, how you're answering it. Um, research and policy are made by, yeah, made by people like me, like you, um, and evidence-based policy is extremely important, but I think it's important that we think about who is producing the evidence, who is writing up studies, who is interpreting them, how we're interpreting them. And that requires recognizing that, you know, we are humans and, and our perspectives influence this entire process. So hopefully you've been able to think critically about me as I've gone through this today, uh, and hopefully that's an exercise you can take forward. Thanks, Kurt. Okay. Thanks so much, uh, Ashley. And um, I know that we already have picked up a question in the chat that we transfer to you. Yes, there's one uh, question. Uh, do you have any insight as to any differences between the Nordic experience compared with the rest of the world, Europe? Any insights as to why there were differences? Oh, that was a good question. Um, no, I, no, I don't think I can compare this data, but it does seem like mental health impacts are very, not only geographic, but they're very temporal. I think it really matters when you're measuring things, what the status of the country was, what had been happening before and after, because countries really did approach this very differently. You know, Norway locked down very early. The US sort of locked down, but also didn't manage to get enough people vaccinated. And it's been kind of awful throughout. You know, China's done something different. So, so no, I, I don't have any good answer besides things might not be, countries might not be comparable or might be comparable, but it, I think it has to do with them when and what is happening and why. And that, that may be the more um, important than, yeah, than trying to kind of draw, draw, see similarities across the board, no matter what. And there's one more question. Do you think uh, the time frame of your study and others is rather short for predicting the effects of the pandemic. Absolutely, that's a great comment, absolutely. Um, and that's, I mean, there's been a ton of research, right? But it definitely makes sense. Maybe you're not gonna see differences or changes after three months, maybe it will take a year, right? I mean, we know mental health does, mental health does change both rapidly and kind of it takes some months maybe to develop some clinical issues and maybe also to get better. Um, so yeah, definitely. I think probably the most important evidence we'll have is in maybe a year or two. This is probably a question for other mental health providers in the audience. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will have time to continue uh, this discussion at the end of the webinar, because it's, uh, I think uh, it's uh, central for uh, the understanding of uh, of the impacts of the pandemic. Okay, once again, thank you, Ashley, for an exciting presentation. And um, I'm the next speaker. Next, please. Next. I will uh, raise three issues. How has COVID-19 pandemic affected young people's everyday life in Sweden? And also in what ways are the changes of everyday life socially structured? And finally, which are the challenges for research and public mental health? Next, please. Next, please. Uh, while uh, young people are less affected by COVID-19 compared to older age group in terms of severe illness and death, 
it's obvious that young people living conditions and everyday life are profoundly affected by COVID-19. And uh, in order to confine the spread of the coronavirus, schools have been closed and distance learning has replaced classroom learning. And this huge consequences in a global perspective is summarized in a very strong way by the president of the World Bank Group, David Malpless, saying that this pandemic has brought about the largest loss of human capital in living memory and the worst education crisis in a century. And I will once again say this is in a global perspective. Next, please. And um, we know from systematics, a number of systematics reviews that uh, the containment the, uh, measures seems to have had an impact on, on young people's mental health. In a recent review published in YAMA a, a few months ago, it was concluded that uh, the first wave of the pandemic were associated with adverse mental health symptoms, distress and anxiety, and health behaviors. But also they added a note that the effects of school closures could not be assessed separately from broader social lockdown measures. Next, please. But it's also important as indicated uh, already in the webinar here that uh, the issue of increasing mental health problems in the Nordic country as well as worldwide is not a new issue. We have for decades, for example, in most Nordic countries seen an increase of self-reported mental health problems among young people in particular among girls. And this is emphasized in a report from UNICEF saying that, in fact, the COVID-19 pandemic represents merely the tip of the iceberg when it comes to poor mental health outcomes. Next, please. It has already, already been, been brought up to front the, the weaknesses of some studies, or I would say maybe most studies so far published about the consequences of the pandemic on the mental health of young people. And that was a reason why the WHO European Technical Advisory Group a year ago recommended countries to monitor changes in mental health at population level through valid standardized and comparable measures and instruments. Next. Next. I will now turn into a Swedish study that we have conducted among students in their age of 16, 17 years old. And one main, main issue, one ma major research question that we addressed was in what ways are perceived changes in everyday life during COVID-19 pandemic 
socialist structures. It's very much about the inequalities in health. Next, please. We collected data uh, during from December 2020 to March 2021 from more than 3,000 16 to 17 years old students in Sweden. And we used a questionnaire about impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on their schooling and everyday life. The data were collected as part of a cohort sequential study. The response rate was 32%. The data were therefore weighted using calibrating weights based on four factors, sex, parental education, immigration, and school marks. Next. We included in total seven questions about changes in everyday life. We asked, have you spent more or less time because of the corona pandemic meeting your friends face to face after school, keeping in touch online or by phone with your friends after school, spending time together with people you live together with, training, working out in gym, playing sports or exercising, using social media, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and so on, watching TV, movies or series, playing games on cell phone, tablet, computer or game consoles. Next. To measure the social structure, we used three variables, sex, parental education, and immigration status. Next. I'm starting to give an overall view how the young people responded to the seven question about the extent to which uh, their everyday life had changed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as you can see that, that 70% reporting less time meeting friends, more than 50% reporting more keeping in touch online with friends after school. And almost 50% reported less time spent on training, playing sports and exercising. And 70% reported using social media to a greater extent than before. Also, 64% saying watching TV more than before, and also more than 50% played games more than previously. Next. If we then look into how these can results can be partitioned and reported according to the socio-demographic background variables. We can see that when it comes to less physical meetings, girls spent less time to a higher degree than boys did. So did also high students with high, higher educational background compared to lower. With respect to less physical exercise, high, uh, students with higher educational background spent less time that, compared to, to those with lower educational background. And the same for immigrants compared to Swedish students. Regarding electronic communication, girls reported spending more time on social media 
to a higher extent than boys did. And the same was also true for students with higher educational background compared to lower. And finally, for electronic media use, immigrants reported less to a higher degree than Swedish students less watching TV. But girls reported, compared to boys, more watching TV during the pandemic. And playing games, playing less games, immigrants report that to a higher degree than Swedish students. And finally, girls reported less time spending, less uh, reported playing games to a less extent than boys did. Okay, next please. These changes in uh, every, this, these changes in everyday life raises issues and calls for action. And uh, the WHO, European Technical Advisory Group, recommended countries to promote, communicate, and increase access to socio emotional learning educational support for learning loss and mental health and psychosocial support in schools and universities and provide more community community support for adolescents and young people next 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 please next please next please in conclusion, living conditions and everyday life are obviously affected for many young people by the COVID-19 pandemic. Perceived changes show a clear social structure. There is a need for studies of high quality that monitor changes in mental health at population as well as subgroups levels. There is also an obvious risk that inequalities in living conditions and mental health of young people will increase in the wake of the pandemic. And that is likely, that risk is obvious within Sweden and other high income countries, as well as between high and low income countries. And finally, there is an urgent need for educational and psychosocial support and special attention needs to be paid to groups at higher risk for school failures. For example, socioeconomic disadvantaged students and those with pre-existing mental health conditions. Next, thanks to all of you for listening. Emily, any questions in the chat? Yes. Uh, do you believe that hearing and involving of children and youth would have had a positive effect of reducing stress? for children and youth, helping them cope and or empowering them. Yes, yes, I think so. I would uh, say uh, I'm sure it has had, but uh, I, I can't right now refer to any studies that confirm those hypotheses. And now, it's time to say welcome to our final presenter, Asher Wedding, 
who is a board member of the Icelandic Disability Association. And he will talk about or make a commentary about young people and the pandemic. So, Adrian, please. So, my name is Eiður Valding and I'm uh, a board member of uh, the Icelandic Disability Alliance here, here back, back here in Iceland. So, uh, I, I want to talk about um, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the, um, on the everyday lives of uh, young people here, here in Iceland. So, here, here in Iceland, we, ha we have had like uh, on and off restrictions since March 2020. Uh, although now we are currently you know, with no restrictions at, at this time. Um, we, I, I sincerely hope that we can keep it that way. Um, but um, in March, the, uh, all, all schools were closed. And, uh, and and they were all sent to uh, remote learning by, uh, at home, and for two months from from March to May, um, that that uh, that had like uh, I I, can, I could feel amongst my my peers that 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 had like a, a great impact on, uh, on on their mental health, and that was just two months. And um, then, uh, then we had like uh, th this period of time where where, uh, where we had like uh, where they eased restrictions and we could uh, get together uh, to to do something fun for for a while, but uh, then again when when I graduated from high, from high school and went to college, um, we we had like these restrictions again, um, so. And then, uh, when you when you start at a new school, uh, in remote learning, you kind of lose the uh, you kind of have this special connection to your school. But uh, when you start uh, in remote learning, you kind of don't have that uh, connection. Uh, as good as other uh, as, as other uh, ages, and um, I, I could feel that um, we kind of uh, we kind of lost our enthusiasm for uh, studying, and uh, many people uh, this spring um, dropped out, and uh, and and are now thinking of dropping out. Um, because um, because although we have had like four months of no co no COVID restrictions, uh, like uh, all, uh, all our uh, our new school experience is like uh, is imp is impacted by COVID. So um, so so we we um, we ca we don't. Uh, we we don't have we don't feel like we belong and uh, that that's that's really bad um, and also like uh, I, I could feel in uh, in the uh, discussion in the, in the uh, also the in, on, in the ongoing discussion about COVID and the, its impact on uh, the lives of our Icelandic citizens and the world uh, we. Um, we we kind of forget to to talk about uh, children with disabilities, and uh, because we we forget for, forget to talk about them, uh, um, I can also feel that um, that that the COVID nineteen pandemic ha has made uh, fe fellow children with disabilities uh, like feel like uh, they don't belong in society overall and that uh, that's something that needs to be fixed like right now we need, we need to uh, when when we talk about covid we uh, we uh, and uh, how how our life is great now um, we we need to talk about uh, the the vulnerable groups that um, are are right now 
self isolate still self isolating because we we are we are having cases of COVID and uh, yeah and COVID is an ongoing pan pandemic across the world and um, now, now uh, that some people just don't uh, feel comfortable with uh, go going amongst people and and uh, disabled people and children with, with disabil disabilities are uh, especially vulnerable to that. Um, so we need to start the discussion of how we can include uh, disabled people in society with regards to uh, to inclusion that makes makes them comfort comfortable with uh, in respect to conditions. Um, yeah, and we we can see. I I I saw this great uh, great great questions in the chat. That I, I I I about uh, social media, and uh, I, I I I actually I I wanted to talk about that like for a long time because uh, I've seen in the uh, in in society like um, older people they they tend to uh, talk about. Uh, social media and uh, phones and electronic devices overall as bad thing. Uh, but the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that actually uh, electronic devices and uh, social media is what keeps us in contact with society. Imagine if we, if we had if we would have the COVID-19 pandemic without any way of community communicating, uh, we we could we imagine having to write letters to uh, across the country just to say how well, just to ask how you're doing, you know. Uh, but now we have uh, now now we have this uh, social media that we can we uh, we can. Re uh, respond within minutes and that is that that is a great thing and i'm i'm very thankful for living in a, a in a century where i can uh, where i can keep in contact with uh, with, with with a peer uh, uh, just on the other side of the world and uh, and we don't have to wait months for the uh, postal service to bring to uh, bring the correspondence uh, back and forth, I, uh, and um, I, I, and it's like uh, it's life changing really. Um, also, we 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 could uh, be, because uh, education and. Uh, uh, and all that and uh, uh, is always developing and I, I i myself is in a school uh, you know that there has been it's the oldest uh, uh, educational institution here in iceland it's called uh, mental school in Reykjavik, or the junior college so by uh, the Reykjavik junior college and it's it, it, it seems like uh, it's older than Iceland, basically, <laughs> and um, and that and that and that school um, had to uh, it, 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 like um, it, it, it takes like uh, a, lo a little bit longer time for for the older schools to to uh, implement new changes into the into the system but then uh, the, then the covid-19 pandemic like kind of forced uh, them to uh, to implement the changes like uh, spontaneously and uh, that that is like uh, the that kind of changed the educational environment here here in Iceland and uh, allowed students that wanted to learn at home to learn at home and I think that is something we can, we should implement in all schools uh, here in Iceland, especially for uh, because we have like really boring winters here in Iceland, 
and we have days that are really dark and really snowy and, I, and people don't want to uh, people want to stay at home and then then we should we, we should really uh, allow people to to use the technology to uh, to participate in society in, at, at the point they feel safe and uh, uh, not only in a pandemic, we should just, we, we should we should take the the teachings of the pandemic and uh, implement them in society post COVID, uh, and uh, because uh, what, what I've been hearing from from uh, the, uh, my peers in the uh, the dis disabled community uh, is that. Um, uh, we, we are we are uh, we we want we want that we want uh, to have like the freedom to choose how we learn and uh, we 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 should be able to to choose uh, the uh, the school uh, we, we want to 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 learn in uh, without uh, basically uh, everyone should uh, should uh, offer uh, remote learning at all all times of year and uh, not only in a pandemic and um, I, I think we, we we here in Iceland we are, we we have we have been doing that uh, like we, we we have been doing uh, that like really nice we are we are uh, when when we uh, when we decided we we need to we need to learn remotely at home uh, like uh, the society came all together and uh, and, um, and, we, and we said to each other you know how how are we going to do this how uh, how, how do you um, how do we want how do we want to do this uh, because we had um, we we have we have had this uh, school school here in Iceland that have uh, for many many years, been been offering like uh, remote learning from home uh, at all times, and we we kind of uh, we we can we we some some schools uh, offered uh, the projects just to present like uh, over the week, and uh, the students kind of did it at home, uh, and that was uh, it was like that when I was finishing my elementary school. Um, they 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 did that. They, they sent projects over over the week, and we we should just uh, return them uh, on Friday. They sent it on Monday, and we should uh, return it on Friday. But then I went to uh, went to the next level of education, the college, and um, and then I I needed to um, that school choose to ha have like. Um, classes uh, at the same time to, uh, just uh, as the curriculum says you know uh, uh, we, we need to uh, lo log on at eight in the morning and then there was there were classes to, until three so we have had like this great variety of schools that uh, that choose all to cho all chose the different uh, different way of doing that but uh, my, my, I personally, and I've been hearing that from my uh, from my peers that um, well, um, so some um, somebody uh, so we some of us chose to uh, to log on at eight and then uh, then like. Uh, keep the keep the teams meeting on going and uh, maybe maybe just dis disregard what what they were saying but, uh, but that is all that's always that uh, the the dangers of remote learning but uh, but we are all we are, uh, but uh, but all, all are we uh, all are we different and we uh, we choose different ways of life um, i but uh, the, the thing is the the point uh, the last point I want to make is that we we, uh, we need to take care of um, uh, of the mental health of uh, young people and 
a look out, uh, lo, lo, like like look after them. So uh, so the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic doesn't affect uh, the ability of having social conversations with. Uh, uh, with, uh, with with other people, and I think that uh, regards all uh, all ages, all age groups, and uh, all, all people. That uh, kind of when when we uh, when we were starting to go out in society again, we kind of uh, we didn't know how to do this. I I, I don't know. Maybe you. Um, uh, maybe you re relate to that feeling you were like uh, doing uh, doing everything remotely uh, for two years then we went to went, went back into society and we were like wow wait wow how did we do this back in 2019 wow <laughs> uh, how do you talk to people face to face you do we, we don't have the, the we we can't uh, uh, when we write messages, we can, we can think about what we're going to say. But uh, if we, if we um, if, if, like face to face conversation, then then we um, we we have, we just say it, and then it's then then, then there is no going back. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, we we need uh, to th we we need. Uh, like, like uh, to have this active conversation on how uh, how how do we want uh, society post COVID and uh, how do we make society like uh, uh, n normal again uh, like it was uh, like it was before COVID. So I want to thank uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this uh, event. Uh, I, want, I want to thank you all for, for listening to me. And uh, uh, I, yeah, have a, have a great day. Uh, I, and I look, I, I look forward to hearing your questions. Thanks so much, Edu. Uh, do we have any Uh, yes, it's two, two questions for, for Eidur. Um, how could we encourage youth uh, academic ambitions and believe in their own future again? Yes. Can you yeah. make a, a brief comment on that? Yeah, can, can you repeat the question, please? I, I... Yeah, how could we encourage uh, youth academic ambition and believe in their own future again? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I've I've been thinking about this uh, about about this myself, like uh, because I'm um, because, um, I I think that we we just need to tell. Uh, Tell the youth that uh, it's okay to feel. Uh, it's okay to feel like uh, not, not, you're not great. Uh, no, you're not. No, you're not maybe doing as good as you were doing uh, before COVID. But we are all in that situ situation. You know, we, uh, we, 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 Nobody knows what they're doing, and every everybody is just doing their best. Um, and and I, I, I think that we we just need to uh, to reach out with that message to to you you know uh, it's uh, that yeah it, it's it's it, it's okay to do just okay you don't need to do like amazingly <laughs> okay thank you Edgar. Any more questions, or should we open the floor for all questions? And uh, do you have, uh, Emily, some uh, general questions that are directed to the whole, to all presenters, or like that? Yes, uh, there's one question for all of you. Uh, do you feel social media, its ease of access? has exacerbated the impact of youngsters being more physically isolated. Yes, who want to 
graphs. Who, who wants to start? Did you, in your review, Ashley, did you find any indications in some directions responding to that question? I was going to say that's a great question. I don't use social media. Uh, but there was one study that looked at. The uh, Ashley, can I ask you again? Take away. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Um, there was one study that looked at the amount of engagement with social media. And I think it, there was some sort of negative relationship between probably stress and amount of social media use, but that doesn't really answer the question. Because the question was about if social media kind of exacerbates, what was it exacerbates? Um, the feeling of isolation? No, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, it was about uh, social isolation. Yeah. Physical social, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. If they were more physically isolated, but there's one comment in the chat that I either answered this question as well in his talk. So, and I think that's that's correct that either was uh, talking about how social media actually can can help staying in in touch with with uh, other peers. And there's uh, there's also one question for Kurt or Ashley, maybe for you both. How could or perhaps should one go about uh, resecting possible effects of hearing and involving children and youth on reducing stress and enhance well being for children and youth in difficult life situations? Yeah, I hand over directly to Ashley. I was going to hand it over to you. So can you say it again, Amelia? <laughs> yes. Um, how could one go about? Resecting, I don't know how to, to pronounce this, sorry, uh, possible effects of hearing and involving children and youth on reusing stress and enhanced well being for children and youth in difficult life situations. But Maretta, can't we send that to you? You have the. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm not sure. I think perhaps the, the question is the researching or how okay, okay. could we research the effect of um, participating or being heard and involved, sort of, uh, if that could reduce that, uh, okay. I think. Okay, I'm sorry. How, how so we, that, is, hmm. Perhaps. I'm not sure I have the right to answer that, but I, I, I would certainly know, would like to know uh, if one could go into that question and see if that could be sort of empowering to hear mm. and involve children. I, I believe it would be mm. helpful. Mm. Okay, how, how, we can, how we can actually evaluate whether or not kind of, uh, yeah, children and youth yeah. involvement can reduce stress. Yes, oh, that's a great mm. question. <laughs> uh, we, we did do a systematic review about um, child and youth involvement in, in child welfare service work and interactions and it's very hard to study this topic it's because you can't you can't randomize people to being either involved or not involved so i think the best bet we have is good kind of qualitative research researchers sitting down with youth and saying give me an example of when you felt involved and when you didn't feel involved what were the differences here what what should be replicated what should be repeated what should we avoid absolutely next time mm -hmm. as i just said to I me mean, we have to make sure we're learning from learning everything we're learning here that works we don't bring it forward um and then Go, go away from what didn't work, right? Mm. Yeah, sure. And, and I think either, is, uh, I would like to comment to the, you either actually on that because I think you have uh, you have mentioned something that I've heard from uh, other youths uh, in the start of our project. It's, it's same, sort of the same as Julia says in one of the interviews that she says it feels like living the same day over and over again, having online education. And that is such a small thing as being given extra data on her phone yeah. would make it possible for her to be social uh, during school time, uh, co-working with her peers, but also afterwards. And, and I think perhaps this, yeah, now it leads up to my comment to you, is what you point out. It's it's an important lesson from the, we have learned during the pandemic. It's, it's what you said, there's no going back, that we need to have an active conversation. How can we learn from online education? 
uh, actually the Norwegian Association for Youth with Disabilities in Norway have been asking for better solutions for online education for years before the pandemic. And they say it's it's sort of puzzling that it, it they have been met with the, uh, from the decision makers that is it's difficult with the data security for once, but also to uh, to cooperate with the schools on this. But during two days, uh, they found a way in no way. So um, I don't think we can switch back. I agree with you. I think that's a very important lesson to uh, be learned from this uh, period. And I think also it's it's an important tool for empowering those who have, doesn't have a voice. Hmm. Uh, I will, uh, Aria, do you want to add or? Yes, I, I thought that I could comment about the services of, of mental health or whatever. So um, uh, I mentioned the school health service and uh, school welfare groups, at least in Finland, we have them, I suppose, as far as know, I know there are most or all Nordic countries have some kind of welfare groups in schools and also school health nurses. So these are the persons whom whom children or in later years also other health services related particularly for young people. So there are places to contact them. And for many, many uh, 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 children uh, or youngsters, adolescents, uh, uh, the school health nurse is such a person who is an easy, easy one to have a contact with. Mm. Um. Thank you, Aria. And uh, we are um, approaching the end of this webinar. It's uh, actually no rush. We is uh, five minutes left. Uh, but I would um, be happy to make an overall reflection on what has been presented and and what, what is known about the impacts of the COVID-19. Uh, Ashley has clearly uh, emphasized that uh, it's a complex, or saying it more soft, the hypothesis about the consequences is, are still not confirmed. And uh, from your Norwegian perspective, it's a discrepancy in between the consensus and what is proven more scientifically. Uh, and I would also add that it's also very clear that as in all research on young people, we should not consider young people to be a homogeneous group. The variability also in the response to the pandemic is very big. And uh, we do know that there are still um, a social structure. And we can see in some areas, in some fields, clear social determinants that, that really has the have an impact on the perceived consequences. And uh, we also do need to look on the very viability issue from another perspective touched on here during the webinar that is about which are the predict protective factors because that directly address the issue about prevention and health promotion work in response to the pandemic. It's just a few minutes left and we can't go, we can't pass technically uh, the deadline. So I take the opportunity now to say thank you to all participants, all, the, all who has listened to and taking part in this webinar and a special thank also, of course, to the presenters. And uh, we are about to finish this session. 
keeping in mind that there are many challenges for us in response to the pandemic, both with respect to research and to, and to prevention and health promotion, not to forget the importance of, of the involvement of young people. So thanks for today and have a good day.